What some call art, police say is a crime. Suddenly, one man's vandalism is another man's masterpiece. Graffiti is everywhere. Today, graffiti is interwoven in the fabric of mainstream culture, from fine art to fashion to music, even corporate advertising. But when the modern graffiti movement was started as an illegal expression of rebellion by teenagers, few realized it would explode into a larger cultural phenomenon. I wanted to get to know the graffiti writers of New York City, and specifically the women writers who are often overlooked in what is notoriously a male-dominated space. Women pioneers have been involved in New York City's graffiti scene since the beginning. And today, a new generation of writers are bringing graffiti into the future and ensuring that its foundations are not forgotten. New York City has a storied history with graffiti. Hip hop was born here during the 1970s, and graffiti became one of the original elements of hip hop. Today, you can find this art form all across the city, from building walls to subway tunnels. Some of it is sanctioned legally by the owners of the buildings, and some of it is defiantly thrown up without permission. Growing up in Florida, I saw some graffiti, but I never thought much about who made it or why. Since moving to New York, where graffiti is almost everywhere, I've gotten more curious about who made these marks, how long have they been here, and what's their story? The first artist I met is Ming, an up-and-coming writer from Queens. She invited me to meet a crew of fellow women writers called GW2 as they worked on a new wall in the Bronx. So who's here who got the invite? Okay, so Kayla was friends with the owners of this restaurant, La Masa. Um, so then she just hit us all up on group chat. These are women that welcomed me into their existing community that they had six years ago. Wow. So I wouldn't have been able to continue painting and never would have benefited from this whole community like had it not been for people like these women who opened up a space in their circle, you know what I'm saying, for friendship, you know, which I think is very rare as you get older, you know. So Kay brought Jay together, and then we all know other women, so Erotica is here, Scratch is here. This is Kay Love, who organized the crew and is a first-generation Puerto Rican-American born and raised here in the Bronx. Most of the walls, the guys, they are given to guys and or street artists. A street artist would get a wall quicker than a graffiti artist. Right. Like if you approach a store owner and be like, I'm a street artist, let me do a mural, they'll be like, yeah. But if you say I'm a graffiti artist, they'll be like, hmm. Yeah. What do you think people commonly most misunderstand about graffiti? I mean, I think the big one that you mentioned yeah. is like street art versus graffiti. I think a lot of people kind of think of those as Yeah, they kind the of think of it thing. all together now. I just did a workshop at Fieldstein High School, right? When I asked them what graffiti was, they went into their phones into Google to give me the answer. I'm like, you guys don't know what graffiti is? You know, so then yeah. they started talking about street art. And I said, that's not graffiti. Yeah. I said, because if it doesn't have lettering, it's not graffiti. Yeah. Like all of us could rock this wall without doing any lettering, it won't be graffiti. Right. It'll just be a street art mural. And an old school graffiti artist would tell you that it's not even called graffiti. They won't even consider themselves a graffiti artist. They would consider themselves a writer. Because right. the essence of graffiti was just writing your name. People have been writing on the walls of buildings and caves since ancient times, but contemporary graffiti as we know it didn't start until the 1960s. To get started with my graffiti history lessons, I turned to some writers who've been tagging across the boroughs for decades. Ming introduced me to one of her mentors, Say TCM, an OG writer who got a start bombing around the Bronx. Back in the days in the Bronx growing up, you know, before hip hop was called hip hop, you had these things that were going on. People were DJing and singing, break dancing, graffiti was going on. And so I gravitated towards the graffiti. When hip hop was born in the Bronx during the 1970s, graffiti became one of the four founding elements of hip hop culture, alongside MCing, DJing, and B boying. But contemporary graffiti itself started in the neighborhoods of Philadelphia as early as 1965 with a teenager named Cornbread. By 1968, the graffiti movement spread into the streets of New York City. So by the time I came along, 77, 78, 79, you know, it was pretty much the norm. It was everywhere, you name it, from the hallways, the buildings, the streets, mailboxes, the trains, just everywhere. 
the Bronx is one of the, the poorest counties in all of New York. Um, lots of projects and all that kind of stuff. You know, there was a lot of burnt buildings. I was during the era when, when pretty much the Bronx was burning down. Landlords are burning their buildings, you know, to get the insurance money and things of that nature. During the 1970s, New York City was bankrupt. Fire stations were shuttered and fire inspections were cut by 70%. Fires were common across Brooklyn and the Bronx. In the Bronx specifically, 80% of housing was lost to burning, displacing 250,000 people. And so it was kind of like a dilapidated environment. There wasn't a lot of sources of self-esteem <laughs> to make you feel good about yourself. You know, but when you're in that environment, you kind of become desensitized to it. And so we made the best of what we had in that, in that time. Could you talk a little bit from your history, why you think there's such few women uh, doing graffiti? I mean, I think originally it's just because it was a male dominated sport, right? It's just like baseball, basketball, football, you know, CEOs of, of companies, no matter the discipline, the idea and the gender roles bled right over, right? So initially, there weren't that many female writers, but they were. Barbara and Ava, you know, 62. You know, after them, you know, Lady Pink came along. Lady Pink got her start in 1979, proving at only 15 years old that she was as good as the best of the boys. And at the age of 15, I started writing graffiti, and I was introduced into the New York City subway trains and the excitement and thrills of vandalizing those, and that was my opening into the world of art. The very first piece that put me on the map, per se, was the very first time I went to go paint a subway train with a bunch of guys. They took me to some place in Brooklyn and had me doing um, my name on the train while a bunch of them are standing and looking over their shoulder at me as if it's not scary enough to be standing on the train tracks. A bunch of guys staring at me. I'm trying to do straight lines. And, but when I achieved it and I got it done from, from beginning to end, that put me on the map. And the guys were like, yeah, yeah, we got to give her respect. Trains like the ones Lady Pink and Say TCM tagged in the early days became the go-to moving canvases for early graffiti because it allowed the work to be seen across the whole city. This led to the style wars where graffiti writers would create elaborate pieces in order to become famous. You know, it was about getting your name out there and getting, getting that fame, that recognition from your peers. During the 1970s, New York City's mayor, Ed Koch, responded to the growing graffiti movement by introducing anti-graffiti laws. The government fought against graffiti by cleaning up subways, even unleashing dogs to attack taggers. By the mid-1980s, the city was succeeding in eradicating graffiti from its train system. Many taggers moved from the trains to building rooftops. This time became known as the Die Hard Era. But by the time the crackdown happened, the graffiti movement had spread around the world, becoming a global phenomenon. Because of the aggressive and macho culture of graffiti, women not only had to act extra tough to be included, they were also at extra risk of being hurt or abused. But I also knew how the game was, very male dominated. Yeah. And abusive to females or girls who want to write. They find a male artist and the guys are like, yeah, I'll take you underneath the wing, but it's all for the bad, the wrong intentions. Right. So it, it is hard. A lot of times I just did stuff solo or just with one or two people. As a girl, you just gotta be tough. Men do dominate, <laughs> you know, the, the graffiti world, um, still do. You know, I think that the difference is that there's not a lot of females that actually own walls, you know, to put something like this together, you know what I mean? Yeah. That you don't see a lot. After they finished the wall in the Bronx, Ming took me to Queens to meet another mentor. Germs is a graffiti writer who also spins under the name DJJS1. Hey, come here. Just try to spray a line right across there. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah not bad, not bad. Yeah, you can just make a line anywhere in there. A little bit different. See, that's not a bad line. Just light and close. Right? Yeah. Light and close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both Ming and Germs are from Queens, and Ming was able to secure this legal wall in the neighborhood she grew up in for the two of them to paint together. Over the years, Queens and the other boroughs have changed as developers have moved in and whitewashed certain neighborhoods. Probably the most famous instance of this is the Notorious Five Points, which was a sanctuary for graffiti artists to do legal pieces, curated by a graffiti writer named Mears Wan. Now when Mears took over, 
Like he really went all out and he treated the place kind of like an outdoor gallery. And it was fantastic. Uh, they would do concerts in the loading dock area, bringing DJs, there'd be people breakdancing and stuff. Over time, that grew so big where it was like a tourist attraction. The owner wanted to knock down the building and put up two um, towers with a bunch of condos. A federal judge told the owner of the building, yeah. it's your building, you're allowed to knock the building down. It's not being landmarked, it's fine. However, give the artist 60 or 90 day notice that you're going to be destroying their artwork. If there's anything that they can come and salvage out of there that they want to take, let them take it. If they want to do new updated photos or whatever of it, just you got to give them, just give them a warning that you're going to do it and then you're allowed to do it. A couple of nights later, he hired some guys and they just went and splashed white paint over all of the artwork on the building. The artist sued the developer and won. Their work was legally protected, just like any other fine art would be. The graffiti community today looks a lot different than it did in its early years. And although the world of graffiti hasn't always been welcoming to women, mentorship between women writers has played an integral part in expanding the legacy of graffiti. Since the 1990s, new women have been appearing all over the world and girls are being made stronger and braver and, and just as reckless as the boys. We have a, uh, a sisterhood going on around the world and we support each other and love each other and um, absolutely it's, it's, it's happening because of the lack of support that some of them have from their own boys. And it's a support system that, that we need. You know, especially in, in these streets right now, it gets a little crazy. For the young women that watch this and are inspired by what you guys are doing, do you have anything that you'd like them to know? No matter what anyone tells you, just, just put your heart and your soul into it and don't wait for people. Yeah. Don't ever wait for people. Take the initiative yourself. It's a beautiful art form. Uh, it's something that could give you a long lasting career. And it's not an art form just for people who just want to be down with it, you know? Yeah. It's something that you live and you breathe, you know? But graffiti is everlasting. Graffiti will never die. Yeah. If, if we wind up going to Mars, there will be someone bombing Mars. Believe you me. Yeah.